Hello, I am Damas. Thank you for joining and I hope you will subscribe. We're going to answer the question today. Are midichlorians real? Let's first look at the infamous video from the Star Wars of the Phantom Menace. Midichlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. Here they're even counting it and how many Anakin Skywalker has compared to uh, other Jedi Masters like Yoda. <clears throat> now, first off, I guess I wanted to hit is, you know, what was it about the midichlorians that people really, really hated? In general, what you wind up finding is that it was something we didn't want to explain. Something that, you know, we actually wanted the mysticism of it. And what I'm going to get to is how we do this in life as well. When it comes to religion and when it comes to higher power, we're not actually looking or expecting that to have a physical composition. Um, but, and here, you know, uh, they say, what does the originator of the Star Wars mythos himself have to say about where midichlorians came from? And uh, so this is Lucas had said, uh, midichlorians are a lucid depiction of mitochondria, which are necessary com components for cells to divide. Star Wars never made what is the force into a central my mystery. All right. So again, before we go on to the rest of uh, what I'm going to get into here, I just kind of thought I'd drop over to this fandom midichlorian page, right? Just to reiterate, midichlorians were microscopic, intelligent life forms that live within the cells of all living beings. The four spoke through the midichlorians. So, again, you know, you might, and rightly so at this point, be saying, well, what's this guy going after and saying, are they real? Let's take a look, though, at what science is doing with other things, right? CERN. CERN is the... Uh, experiment that's going on in Europe uh, to split atoms and split atoms in new ways to determine new matter and new materials. So the Higgs boson is what, what they've been, what has become to be called the God particle. You know, there is much benefit in combining the results of large experiments to reach the high precision needed for the next breakthrough in our field. Um, now scientists will be able to use the Higgs boson as a reference for further study, opening up the possibility of dis discovering new physics phenomena. So, you know, um, and the results largely match with the predictions of the standard model, which explains how much of the universe works at a subatomic level. All right. Um, this article here from Extreme Tech, uh, I like the ending of this, because this is kind of where I'm going with this. It, so what's next for the God particle? Um, it has an eye into everything from antimatter to dark energy. Dark matter is thought to interact with regular matter solely through the medium of gravity, and by creating mass, the Higgs boson could be crucial to understanding exactly how. There's more with scientists delving into the inner workings of the universe and our basic matter, our, our, our basic atoms, what we're created from. So it's not an unusual thing to say, maybe there is more to us than just what we believe. Um, yeah, so and, and let me let me hold that point there for you for a little bit. Um, this one is just and, and I'll give you uh, links under in the description as I always do with my videos. This one is you know pretty much I just kind of wanted to get into you know Stephen Hawking says God particle could wipe out the universe, and basically in the article it's it's saying that you know. There's um, the Higgs boson is such a peculiar um, and a specific part of the matter uh, molecule, and something again that scientists were looking for because there is this missing element. Anyway, so they're saying this missing element, which is kind of interdimensional, um, is necessary for the balance of the universe to exist. So that's kind of a scary thing. Then when we start looking at the type of people who are 
in charge of CERN. Now this is, you know, this is really just to give you a quick picture, you know. So the government of India gave a um, statue to CERN as a gift. And so this statue is the statue of Shiva, the god of destruction. Now in Indian lore, it's, it's more than god destruction. It's the god of everything. Um, it is another god, all right? Um, so it's interesting, right? Because, you know, the, this article is about why does a research institute have a statue of religious artifact? The... <clears throat> You know, there again, I just want to point out, Shiva is known as the destroyer. Uh, suspicions persist, however. Um, you know, so Christians who believe that scientists at CERN are, are playing God, CERN has tried to lay these concerns. Um, among other misconceptions, the LHC is sadly not trying to open a door to another dimension. But here's the thing. If you have the key building blocks, blocks of matter, if you have, if you are able to determine the key to how matter is built, you then have the key to how it is reassigned. So, again, I started out, and, and it, this is really just to show an example of that it is not maybe so far-fetched to say something like many chlorians exist because CERN has been doing working with the god particle for quite some time and really been looking to try and find the heart of what is matter right. so this is an article dated November 14th 2004 and this is um, <clears throat> uh, about a scientist an American scientist named um, and this all came out around the same time, this information. Uh, American scientist who believes that he found the God gene. This scientist, um, his name is Dean Hammer, or Hamer, Dean Hamer, the director of Gene Structure and Regulation Unit at the National Cancer Institute in, Be in Bethesda. Um, <clears throat> it shows that he was researching around this VMAT2 gene. Now, VMAT2 gene is something that's been talked about quite some time, I think, in, in medicine. This is Psychiatric Times. This is dated 2008. And this just goes into, you know, if you, I'm not going to bore you here, but this goes into what the ves vesicular monomine transport is, or the VMAT2 carrier. All right, so, and this is, <clears throat> this is something found in human physiology. And the interesting in here, and I think uh, down here, <clears throat> currently all drugs known to bind to the VMAT inhibit, inhibit its function, similar to the manner in which antidepressants and stimulants affect. Um, currently, VMAT2 inhibitors are available in the United States for clinical use. Uh, they're reserpine. Um, tetrabezanine, um, and some others here that are listed. And I'll, again, you'll have the link so you can look for yourself. But the interesting thing is that this is already, this, you know, drugs to manipulate this gene, this VMAT2 gene, already exist. So <clears throat> I think the big time when this came before the mass public was October 25th. 2004 when Time published this and I uh, was able to find on eBay and able to find a copy of this magazine and I'm just gonna throw up a couple parts here just to key in on it so this was again October 24th uh, um, 25th 2004 the God gene and the interesting thing does our DNA compel us to seek a higher power believe it or not some scientists say yes so in this article, there are some interesting things here said, you know, so, um, and, you know, and basically what this scientist did, this, this Hamer scientist, he was on this research project for how people are addicted to smoke. 
and he actually used some of that research to feed his other research are on some people, for better or worse, addicted to God, All right? So, um, he, he also says he has located one of the genes responsible, a gene that just happens to also code for production of the neurotransmitters that regulate our moods. Our most profound feelings of spirituality, according to a little reading of Hamer's work, may be due to little more than an occasional shot of intoxicating brain chemicals governed by our DNA. I'm a believer that every thought we think and every feeling we feel as a, as the result of, is the result of activity in the brain. I think we follow the basic law of nature, which is that we're a bunch of chemical reactions running around in a bag. All right. I didn't say that. Hamer said that. <laughs> but, you know, and it says even for the casually religious, uh, you know, this is uh, a lot to take. The very meaning of faith, after all, is to hold fast to something without all the tidy cause and effect that science finds so necessary. I hope you're seeing here, though, now, what I'm talking about is our midi-chlorians real. I'm not saying our Star Wars midi-chlorians real. I am asking the question, is the concept of one being more close, more capable of feeling religion, is it actually not just something that we think, but something that we're programmed, for better or worse, at birth to do? And when you think about it, why wouldn't an intelligent, intelligent God give you something that was physically connected to him all through your life. On some of these other pages, there's some interesting stuff, too. Um, so, again, this is talking about how he used this data from, from another research project and dumped it into this. Uh, to narrow the field, Hamer confined his work to nine specific genes known to play major roles in the production of monamine, monam, monahamines, brain chemicals, including serotonin, uh, nora and dopamine that regu regulate such fundamental functions as mood and motor control. It's monomines that are carefully manipulated by Prozac and other antidepressants, uh, antidepressants and also mon monomines that are not so carefully scrambled by ecstasy. So, again now, so this scientist has made a connection between our faith or our ability to have faith our likelihood to have faith in chemicals in our body. And, and not just chemicals in our body, but how chemicals can affect that. This is more commentary from this article than, you know, factoid or anything. But it's an interesting supposition. They say, still, for every place in the world that's suffering from religious strife, there are many more whose spirituality is doing its uplifting, uplifting and civilizing work. A God who equipped us with the genes and the smarts to cooperate in such a clever way is a God who ought to be appealing even to religious purists. Nonetheless, sticking points do remain that prevent genetic theory from going down smoothly. Uh, one that's particularly troublesome is the question of why Hamer's God gene, or any of the others may, that may eventually be discovered, is just distributed so unevenly amongst us. Why are some of us spiritual virtuosos while others can't play a note? Isn't one of the central tenets of religion, that grace is available to everybody. Well, why are some people piano virtuosos? Why are some people artists? Why are some people <clears throat> good with their hands building things? Why are some people thinkers, right? Um, it's not saying that everyone doesn't have this capability. It does, it's not saying that everyone doesn't have that connection to God. And certainly, as it says there, grace is available to all. Christian grace is available to all. But I just think it is an interesting concept that came across not too long ago. This whole thing of, are we programmed to have faith? Much like a Jedi. So, there you go. Are midi-chlorians real? It's for you to decide.